What's up, Wizlords? It's Deb from SBNTG. We're just a bunch of magic likers around here. Now, I figured I'd pop my head out of the lab tonight because I've been doing a lot of messing around with Core Set 2021 stuff, and those videos are coming very soon. I promise you, in just the next couple of days, you'll get some top 10 sleepers and top 20 cards. It is happening soon, but I've, I got to level with you here and be 100% honest. Part of the reason for the delay on those videos is because I've been having a lot of fun in the Arena Cube event. My only real complaint is that the event is a little steep to enter at 4,000 gold a pop, but everyone gets their first one for free, and if you get 5 wins, you break even on gold. If you get 6 or 7 wins, then you net 1,000 or 2,000 gold respectively. So a skilled player can just rack up gold in this event, and I want you to be a skilled player. So what I've done today is I've put together a bunch of different top tens and whatnot, not only the best cards in this cube, but some of the biggest traps in this cube, as well as some cards you should be taking a little bit higher than I've seen people take. And on top of all that, the absolute worst cards in this cube to watch out for. So that is a lot to talk about. Just before we get into it, remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel for a lot of content, including all the Core Set 2021 stuff that you ever wanted. But we still got a week to play this Arena Cube event, so I wanted to go ahead and give you some strat while I still could. There's plenty of time left to play this event, and I want you to be good at it. So let's go ahead and get into it. Start with the absolute best cards in this cube. Now, best cards is the only category that gets an honorable mention because I wanted to bring up Elspeth Conquers Death and its counterpart, The Eldest Reborn, somewhere in this video. And best card seems like a pretty good place to do it, but it's nowhere near some of the other bombs that you can actually get in this cube event. There's a lot of really powerful cards, but in a set where there's a lot of powerful cards, things like Elspeth Conquers Death are particularly good because the ability to exile something three or more is easily the best ability on this card. But being able to get your big bomb out of the graveyard also sweet. Eldest Reborn, not quite as good in a lot of situations because the first removal mode isn't as good, especially in a format with a fair amount of tokens, which this cube is, but still, you will remove a creature when it enters the battlefield, and the ability to get something out of their graveyard when it pops off in the third chapter is really powerful, as well as making them discard a card. But let's go ahead and start the list with number 10, In Bolus's Clutches. This is one of the most powerful removal pieces in the entire cube, and I do think it's just a step better than either ECD or Eldest Reborn. This is a cube format with so many ridiculously powerful bombs at the top end that a card like Embolus's Clutches really justifies its six mana casting cost. And as a matter of fact, there's a fair amount of six CMC things on the best cards list because games in this format tend to be slightly slow, although there is some aggro. There is an abundance of removal and even a fair amount of sweepers that we have access to in this format. So games tend to go a little bit longer, not just because of the singleton format, but because a lot of people have drafted the best cards at five six and even seven mana some of the time so everybody wants to play those bombs and very often games go much longer than they would in say constructed environments so cards like in Bolus's clutches at six mana usually would be a little bit steep but in this case this will just steal whatever giant bomb your opponent is playing whether it be a creature or a planeswalker which are very effective in this format or a big powerful enchantment that they may have in some cases based their entire deck around stealing that from them is often a game win so in Bolus's clutches has overperformed time and time again in my experience with this cube. Now, speaking of powerful enchantments, by the way, I mentioned them briefly. I'll go ahead and bring up Mirari's Wake at number nine here. Again, tons and tons of powerful enchantments that you can effectively build a deck around in this environment because there are multiple tutors and stuff, so it's not too hard to get your big powerful bomb even if it's an enchantment in this especially actually if it's an enchantment because we have access to idyllic tutor in this environment so cards like mirari's wake are at a premium in this environment but mirari's wake is one of the best of these five mana power enchantments because you don't really have to build a deck around it you're going to play creatures you're going to play lands and you're going to want to get more juice out of those lands so mirari's wake is a really good reason to go into green white and there's not a whole lot of amazing reasons to do so aside from some removal and some big creatures yes green and white are actually fairly powerful in this cube but Many color combinations have it over green-white in terms of what you'd like to pick, but Mirari's Wake really, really puts you into those colors. Now at number 8, I've got Bolus's Citadel. It's a little bit tough to cast, and yeah, it's another 6-drop, and big news, there's another 6-drop after this one as well. Again, I just don't think there's too many penalties for playing 6-drops in this environment, especially in a color like black, which is kind of at a premium in this environment. It's got so much good removal and some really good top-end threats as well. So a card like Bolus's Citadel pays off, even though there's not a whole lot of great life gain in this format that you want to play, and that does kind of knock Bolus's Citadel down a peg. Still, when it's resolved, it's 
just one of the best cards in terms of pure card advantage, and you often don't mind paying a few life to get ahead on card advantage. It's also worth noting that I've been killed once <laughs> in cubes so far by the opponent actually activating Bolas' Citadel and just hitting me for 10, just tinning me. So that, that has happened as well, and I'm sure it'll probably happen again because the City's Blessing is a real deck in this format. But again, games go relatively long in this environment, so it shouldn't be too uncommon to actually activate it. But even if you don't, just using it for card advantage, it's still one of the best cards in this whole environment. Now, number seven is Kogla, the Titan Ape, because there hasn't been a single time that I've resolved Kogla that it hasn't changed the entire complexion of the game. But for one, there's a ton of large creatures in this environment, so Kogla can fight those, and very often stay alive means a huge deal. There's also a ton of creatures in this environment that might not be too big, but they have important activated abilities or triggered abilities um, during the upkeep phase, for instance, like Dragon Master Outcast, right? If you don't have good removal for that, sometimes you'll just Kogla it to death, but there's plenty of really good targets for Kogla in this environment, so I've played this on pretty much every chance that I've gotten to play it, and again, it hasn't ever underperformed for me. The ability to swing in and kill an artifact or enchantment is also very, very important. I want to point that out. Plus, there's tons of good humans in this environment, so the ability to make this indestructible at just two mana actually comes up a good bit. There's just nothing bad about Kogla. Now, number six is Fauna Shaman. This is just an unbelievably powerful card, and even though it is restricted to having to discard a creature, which sometimes doesn't feel great, there are turns where Fauna Shaman will sit on the battlefield with not much to do, and that's why it's down here at number six, but there are also plenty of games where this just ditches a creature you don't care about too much and goes and fetches the biggest bomb in your deck. If you are able to draft up just a ludicrous creature, <laughs> then this will help you get it into play, or at least get it into your hand pretty easily, and makes those decks that you want to build around a specific creature, like Winota, for example, um, much, much more consistent. Number five is Siege Gang Commander. This is just an unbelievable card every time I choose to play it. It's a board in a box, just a board on demand. You get a whole bunch of creatures all at one time, and they all have the ability to either remove small creatures, gang tackle large creatures if you have enough mana to do so by sacrificing them, um, or they just go face, you know, deal up to six damage to your opponent if you have the mana to do so, and just finish off games in aggro. There's also a ton of token strategies. This aids and abets really, really well. Um, um, there's things like Divine Visitation, for instance, in this format, and if you have a Visitation out and you play this, congratulations. <laughs> you just put a whole bunch of power on the battlefield, 14 to be exact. Um, so there's just so many cool things about Siege Gang Commander in this format, whether you're playing aggro or tokens or sacrifice synergies, for instance. There's Mayhem Devil in this format, so that effectively makes each goblin you sacrifice a bolt. So there's just a lot of really cool ways to leverage Siege Gang Commander in this format. But even if you don't have any way to synergize with it, it's still just an entire board on demand that also can kill stuff. Now at number four, we've got Tinder Shoot Dryad, and honestly... It's kind of hard to say which one is the better card, Siege Gang Commander or Tinder Shoot Dryad, but over the course of Long Wars of Attrition, it's definitely Dryad. And again, games go relatively long. Dryad is fairly easy to remove in this environment, but if you drop it later on in the game when your opponent's a little bit more dry on removal or have been able to get some of the removal out of their hand by, you know, making them target other creatures, Tinder Shoot can stick around for a few turns, and once it does so, it helps you get the city's blessing, starts making 3 threes on every turn, not just your turn, it's every single upkeep. And this can just take over the game really, really quickly, just in the course of two turns. This can take over a game if it's making 3 threes, so it is a little bit tough to protect, but when it does get time to work, Tinder Shoot Dryad almost always wins the game by itself. Number three is Search for Iskanta. It's it's back. Everybody play Search for Iskanta again. And in a format with so many amazing non-creatures, especially Planeswalkers and whatnot, this just has a million things it can hit. And honestly, Control is a pretty effective deck type or archetype in this environment. There's a lot of good counter spells. I've already mentioned there's a lot of good um, removal in this format, including a fair amount of sweepers and whatnot. So there's a lot of good card draw as well. So Control is just a very effective deck, in my experience, in this cube. And Search for Iskanta is easily one of the best if not the best, card that a control deck can have access to. And number two is one of the strongest cards in Standard as well, and that's Euro Titan of Nature's Wrath. Now, Euro still does everything in this environment, right? <laughs> Just for three mana, being able to draw a card and drop an extra land is actually 
well, uh, yeah, and gain three life, by the way. <laughs> just keeps doing things, doesn't it? <laughs> it's actually a really good deal on turn three to get other plays set up. And then late in the game, it's honestly not too hard with all the decent spells and smallish creatures and whatnot. Especially with all, again, the removal in this format, putting creatures in your yard. It's not too hard to escape this. And if you can escape it even once, then it's doing really, really cool stuff for you. So, Euro is still, <laughs> you know, resilient, um, gains your life, draws your cards, is a ramp piece. It just still does all the things in this environment that it does so effectively in Standard, and that makes it easily one of the most powerful cards. But number one, I'm actually going to cheat a little bit and just say Planeswalkers. I've already alluded to this, but Planeswalkers are unbelievably powerful in this format because, again, there's not too much aggro that you run up against. There is some, but for the most part, again, people want to play their big bombs and their big exciting cards and whatnot. So you will see, you know, a fair amount of mostly mid-range decks and some control decks and whatnot. So Planeswalkers, once resolved, are just really difficult to get rid of outside of Murderous Rider and, you know, white removal like Banishing Light and Prison Realm, which are very good cards. There's just not a whole lot of straight-up removal against Planeswalkers in this environment. So, Planeswalkers in general are good, but keep your eye out especially for things like the 5-mana Ashiok, 5-mana uh, Teferi, 6-mana uh, Liliana. All of these are just unbelievable in this environment for their ability to not only, you know, in some cases, like the Ashiok and the Liliana, create a board presence, but in all of these cases, just remove creatures fairly effectively. Um, Chandra, the 6-mana Chandra, and Sarkin the Masterless are also good ones to keep a lookout for because Chandra is effectively a sweeper, which is an amazing tool to have. But it's also something that can just win you the game over the course of a few turns. And again, Wars of Attrition are fairly popular, or fairly common in this environment. And then Sarkin can at least leave behind a 4-4 flyer in terms of value, and that's great. But if you've drafted up, you know, even one or two other Planeswalkers, sometimes this does amazing work for you. So, again, keep your eye out for Planeswalkers and draft them almost whenever popular, or whenever possible. I made a, a tweet last night that was like, hey, you want a quick tip? For Cube, just draft all the Planeswalkers and win a bunch of money. And that's it's honestly working out for me so far. But moving on to our next category here in terms of lists, let's talk about traps in this environment. And I'll start with number 10, Juggernaut. Now, Juggernaut is a good example of how the traps list works. You know, the, the higher up, or I guess the lower on the list you are, you know, Juggernaut is the lowest possible entry in this case. Uh, the lower on the traps list you are, the less of a trap you are, right? There are some decks these cards can work in, but by and large, I don't necessarily think you should draft them, right? Like, Juggernaut could go in, like, an artifact aggro deck with Steel Overseer. And there's a couple of artifact payoffs in this format, like the 5 mana Tezzeret. So there are some cool things you can do with the Juggernaut, and if you're just drafting a straight aggro deck that wants to play a decent 4-drop, you could do worse than Juggernaut, but you could do a whole lot better than Juggernaut as well. So I just think that it's not, you know, 1994 anymore, so <laughs> Juggernaut just doesn't look as good in the face of a whole bunch of other amazing cards that are available to draft in this cube, especially in the 4-drop slot. There's a whole bunch of power, and you could just do better than Juggernaut 90% of the time, so don't uh, just don't draft it. Number 9 is Niv-Mizzet Reborn. Now, this one is a trap just because it's relatively hard to put together five colors, and even if you do, you might only draw, like, one card off of this. And honestly, a big five-mana creature that has an evasive ability and draws you a card is probably worth it, but it's just so difficult to cast this thing that I just don't think it's going to be worth it 90% of the time that you draft it. And if you draft it as your first or second pick, you decide to build your entire deck around it, there's going to be a few times where the mana just doesn't work and you lose games because no other reason than that. And that's not how I want you to lose games. So most of the time, I would stay away from niv Mizzet Reborn. Now, number eight is Sudden Spinnerets, which is a decent combat trick, but probably not decent enough in this environment. You know, there's just so many extremely powerful cards that if you're trying to build a 40-card deck and, you know, 23 of those cards are real, 17 are land. So assuming that you have, like, 22 or 23 slots in your deck, I just don't think that you want to include this because you probably have much, much, much better cards you could be including than Sudden Spinnerets, which might be a decent combat trick, but it might not even kill the creature that you're blocking. So I'm just not a huge fan of Spinnerets. Um, and I, I, I don't think, especially in the face of the other combat tricks you could be drafting, that this is a very good card. I would just rather have like Giant Growth than Sudden Spinnerets. But anyway, moving on. Number seven is Riss the Redeemed. Here's where we're going to start hitting really, really powerful cards, and you're going to be like, what? Scratching your head. Now, Riss the Redeemed goes very well in token strategies specifically. So if you're building a deck that is 100% focused around tokens, Riss is a pretty good one-drop. But 
At the same time, <laughs> Riss hasn't really done almost any work for me in the games that I've drafted it, and I've drafted it a couple of times trying to make tokens decks work. And tokens, and again, that, these have been I've drafted these into tokens decks where they just haven't done all the work in the world for me because there's a lot of focus on you know getting good, not necessarily curving out, but doing cool stuff on turns three, four, five, six. You know, just playing the most powerful cards that you can, uh, usually past turn three or four, and. Riss doesn't really let you do that because this is a fairly desirable mana sink on turns where you draw dead, but on most turns you'll have a much better play than just making a token with Riss. And number six is Ulamog. Now, one of the reasons that Ulamog is down here at number six is because there is the odd deck that can play this card. Again, there's a fair amount of ramp in this environment, but if you draft Ulamog relatively early, you must focus on drafting almost nothing but ramp until the end of the draft. It's it's basically like that, and dra ramp is very powerful, uh, very popular in this draft environment. So it's entirely possible other people will be taking the ramp cards, because ramp cards are at a premium in this environment. So don't even count on getting all the ramp that you need to get Ulamog out in the first place. But if you are playing ramp, Ulamog is probably, in a vacuum, the single most powerful card in this entire set, um, in this entire format. So, you know, if you just want raw power figures, yeah, Ulamog's probably number one in terms of best cards, but this card is really, really difficult to cast in most games unless you have some very reliable and plentiful ramp. So just keep that in mind. If you just draft Ulamog and you're just building, like, you know, black-white or, like, red-green aggro or something with no ramp in it, don't you probably don't want to actually play Ulamog because you're almost never going to get the chance to cast it. It's just going to sit in your hand like a wet trout, all, like a dry salmon. I mean, <laughs> it's probably worse than a wet trout, actually. Um, all game, and you're just going to get really mad that you can't actually cast this super powerful card. So, again, unless you can reliably do so, I just would not draft this card. Now, number five is a Chroma's Memorial, which is not a terrible card, obviously. Again, that's why it's over here at number five, but you mostly want to utilize this in aggro decks, but you also can't cast it in aggro decks because it costs seven mana, right? And sometimes it doesn't even have like a real effect on the board the turn you play it, and when you pay seven mana for a card, you want it to affect the game right now, and this doesn't always do that, especially if you don't like have any creatures <laughs> at the time. This is really does literally nothing. Protection from black and red is actually really, really good and sometimes the most important abilities on the card. But, you know, this also gives you creatures evasion and a whole bunch of other important abilities. But again, when it doesn't affect the board for seven mana, that really, that hurts so badly. And if you do have a deck that leverages it well by playing a lot of creatures, again, it's going to take a while before you can actually cast it. You'd probably just rather play something that costs less and help you win the game on turn in like five, so you know, I just I, I think that a Chroma's Memorial is a bit of a trap in a lot of situations. Now, number four is Ranger of Eos, which is a good card, but again, there's just not that many amazing one drops. I mean, if you play this to go get your wrists, that's good. Play this to go get your Dragon Master Outcast, that's pretty good. But when you play this to go get like your sparring construct, that's pretty awful. <laughs> It's just it's not very good. So I'm just not a big fan of one drops in limited. Period, unless again, unless they're named Dragon Master Outcast. Um, so, unless you've built your deck around Dragon Master Outcast or maybe some other really specific one drop, I just don't think Ranger is very good. In some aggro decks, this could work where it's going to get a Venerable Knight and a Sky March or Aspirin or whatever, but for the most part, I just think that Ranger is kind of not the best card in the world in this environment, particularly. Now, number three is Wynota. Now, I know that I brought this card up earlier and said if you're building a deck around a good creature like Wynota, yeah, I mean, she is decent, but you also have to have a decent mix of non-creatures early on the curve, uh, or non-humans early on the curve, and then, like, good humans higher up on the curve to really, like, maximize the potential of this card. And there are ways of doing that in this environment, but the chances that you just draft up the perfect Wynota deck are really, really low because so many things have to go right and so many you know, specific cards have to be passed to you, that the chances, again, are just radically low that you'll actually be able to build a decent Winota deck. And that's not even, you know, bringing up the most important point, which is that you can't play four Winota. As a matter of fact, you can't play multiples of anything in this environment. It's impossible. You'll only see one of everything ever. So 
That's that's the thing with Winota is that you know the standard decks that have to play Winota by turn four play four copies of this plus multiple ways of getting her on the battlefield and tutoring her up like Neo form for instance. And you don't have all of the best ways of doing that in this environment. You do have some tutors. You do have like Fauna Shaman for instance, um, and a couple of other things that can do it. But for the most part, it's not reliable because if you spent your first few turns doing things like Fauna Shaman, you don't have all the best you know non-human creatures to attack with unless you went like Fauna Shaman into Legion War Boss, but then you didn't have the extra mana to use Fauna Shaman to go get Winota. So you see what the problem is here? There's just some issues with building Winota in this format, but the biggest one is that you can only ever play one. Now, number two is Platinum Angel. Now, this is another one that might be like, what? But honestly, there's just so much good removal in this environment that your Platinum Angel is not going to stay out for very long in my experience at least. Even if your opponent doesn't have the removal spell for it when you play it, they're probably going to draw into one that can kill it in just a couple of turns. I've already talked about Elspeth Conquer's death and in Bolas's clutches. God forbid they in Bolas's clutches this, but <laughs> there's also, you know, Eldest Reborn and a ton of other stuff, you know, Murderous Rider. Um, there's also the Acroan War, which can steal this for a couple of turns and that feels really bad. There's just so many good removal pieces in this environment. You know, if you want to play Platinum Angel in a format that also has Lava Coil, you go ahead and do that, but I just don't think that Lava Coil, or that Lava Coil, Lava Coil is a good card, uh, but that Platinum Angel is worth the seven mana in this environment where it's very often going to get hit by any of those removal spells or Banishing Light or Prison Realm or just a hundred other things that they can do to your Platinum Angel. It's just not safe to spend seven mana on this card. So let's move on to number one here, which pains me, but it's Mox Amber. Uh, don't draft this card. There are a lot of legends. There's even a legendary deck you can build with like Captain Cisse and Black Blade Reforged and legendary sorceries, you know, which legendary sorceries aren't terrible if you've got a few planeswalkers and stuff in your deck. Um, but I still don't, I'm a little bit wary of the legendary sorceries. They almost made the trap list, but Mox Amber is the ultimate trap. <laughs> it is much more of a trap than the legendary sorceries. Unless you're playing a deck that hardcore needs artifact synergy, I just don't think this is it, Chief. Maybe you're playing a ramp deck that also has a bunch of legends in it. Maybe, but I, again, I just Mox Amber just does not seem like a very good card to me, um, especially in a format where the ability to tap this for mana uh, probably won't happen until like turn four. And yeah, you might be able to get some value, some valuable ramp because there's a lot of good six and seven drops in this format. But even then, it's just not worth the slot in your deck when you could be playing far more powerful cards and even far more powerful ramp for what that's worth. But let's move on here to the next list. It is a really long video. I apologize for that. And that is cards to take higher. Cards that I see wheel occasionally, that is go all the way around. You see them twice uh, before anyone takes them. And that's a, that's a little really very surprising in a, in a lot of these cases. Like, for instance, number 10, uh, Mace of the Valiant. But also, I'm going to cheat here a little bit and say Sigiled Sword of Valoran as well, uh, and just equipment in general in this environment, but these two are criminally underdrafted. Sigiled Sword is very powerful, um, and as is Mace of the Valiant in like tokens builds, but Mace of the Valiant really needs a few creatures to really getting to get going. But the Snowball is very real on uh, Mace of the Valiant, so keep that in mind. But even in the case of Sigiled Sword, this makes you know even the smallest creatures pretty formidable in combat and creates a board presence while you're at it. So I just don't see these taken very often. These are much better than, say, Auras in draft. So if you are building a sort of aggro deck or even a mid-range deck, these equipments can actually overperform in a lot of cases. Especially considering there's not a whole lot of artifact removal in this environment. But I'm going to move on to number 9, which is Roar of the Worm. I see this wheel all the time. All the time. Maybe they're just better ramp targets. Um, but, I mean, a lot of people seem to draft ramp in this environment. So, again, I'm just surprised that I don't see this card go. Um, maybe it's because, and this is a weird speculation, but maybe it's because a lot of people playing Arena have just never seen or played with Roar of the Worm. Um, you know, it hasn't been in standard the entire time that arena has been a thing. It hasn't been in standard for a really long time, actually. So there's just probably a lot of people that have experienced War of the uh, Roar of the Worm. It's a very good magic card. Yeah, it makes like not a super impressive creature, but it's got really big stats and it does it twice. And it's actually easier to do it the second time. And uh, there's cards like, you know, Tormenting Voice. I think Cathartic Reunion is in this environment. So there's a few things that help you discard cards into your graveyard. Or there's stuff that, you know, mills stuff in your graveyard, like Stitcher Supplier, for instance. 
uh, that would go really, really well <laughs> with cards like Rural of the Worm because, you know, a cheap 6-6 six, six is amazing, but being able to just cast two 6-6s six, off the same card is really good, especially with all the token synergies in this environment. So, again, I'm just really surprised I don't see Roar go a little bit faster because it could go in a lot of players' decks. And number eight is a card that you might think would be on the trap list, but actually, no, Field of the Dead is a playable card in this environment. There are a ton. I think there's close to 40 uh, different lands in this environment. So filling out the clause that your lands have to have different names actually isn't as tough as you think it is. And there are a ton. There are uh, so many cards that go and get a land for you, right? There's like Golos in this environment. Um, there's Elvish Reclaimer, I think it's called, in this environment. There's also uh, Knight of the Reliquary in this environment. Just all of these can go and grab lands for you. Mastermind's Acquisition can go and grab this for you. There's just a lot of really, really, you know, easy tutors to go get Field of the Dead. So even though you can only play one of them, there's a lot of Wars of Attrition. It's not hard to get this card in play in the first place and just get a free zombie every turn. And you can play stuff that lets you play extra lands in a turn. Wayward Swordtooth is in this environment, as is like Dryad of the Elysian Grove and all kinds of stuff that helps you play extra lands. You know, I've, I've already brought up Eero, Gross Spiral is in this environment, as is our Royal Grazer, just so many things that let you play extra lands. So Field of the Dead in the 22 land Field of the Dead limited deck is actually very real. Now, number seven is the Mending of Dominaria. I just see this thing, you know, drafted next to last, like all the time, and that really baffles me. Not only can this get a couple of important creatures out of your graveyard, but it can also ramp you really effectively if you get this early enough in the game. If you're actually able to cast this on turn five, and with some ramp, you cast it on turn four. In just a couple of turns, it will often put two to four lands into, you know, into play for you. And if you have a way to mill stuff or sacrifice lands, then it can put even more lands into play for you and just ramp you into huge stuff like Ulamog. This is actually one of the key cards in the Ulamog deck if you build the Ulamog deck in a very specific way. So keep that in mind. But this is this is good ramp. And it's actually a decent card advantage for green decks that don't have access to it in other ways. Being able to get stuff out of your graveyard is really important in a, in a format that has tons and tons of huge bomb creatures. So just don't, you know, I see people not taking this card seriously, and it's actually fairly powerful. Now, actually, number seven dovetails into number six, where I'm just going to say powerful enchantments, which I brought up earlier, but if I had to bring up one specifically, it would probably be Patient Rebuilding, because this one is criminally undertaken. I've seen this one wheel a few times, and that just... I don't understand. It's just an unbelievable card where not only can control decks use it as a mill piece to just win the game, but even if you're not counting on milling your opponent out for the win, this still it often equates in, you know, really, really good card advantage where it can draw you up to three extra cards per turn, but very often draws you at least one extra card per turn. And that's just unbelievable. You know, yeah, it costs five mana. Yeah, it doesn't do anything until your next turn, but very often that's incredibly worth it. And I can't understate that. Patient Rebuilding is just such a good card once resolved. And there's not really a whole lot of ways to take out enchantments in the main deck in this format, aside from some things that hit all permanents and things like Reclamation Sage and Mortify. So there are some checks and balances on enchantments, but things like, you know, what is it? Sigil of the Empty Throne, I think it's called. Um, and uh, even Fires of Invention, you know, the Divine Visitation. These are all really, really powerful enchantments. You can build entire decks around. As a matter of fact, I've drafted Fires twice <laughs> in this environment so far, and I haven't gotten less than six wins with it either time. So Fires, if you build it right, is still a really powerful deck, but all of these enchantments can form the basis of incredibly powerful decks, and a lot of these I don't see getting taken when they should, but Patient Rebuilding is probably the biggest one. Now we're going to dovetail into another one. Number five is Mastermind's Acquisition and Idyllic Tutor. I wanted to bring that up because, again, I think it dovetails nicely with all the um, powerful enchantments you can build a deck around because Idyllic Tutor effectively gives you a second copy of them, and many of them cost four or five mana. So, you know, if you spend three mana on Idyllic Tutor, you can curve into them pretty nicely at that point. So I really like Idyllic, but I especially like Masterminds, and I don't see people take this card near enough. Now, there are a lot of more powerful cards. You have to get the cards you'd want Tutor for first before you get the tutor, but that said, I've seen this card wheel a few times, and I just don't get it, especially in, like, pack two or three. I still see Mastermind's Acquisition come back around to me after I've already picked from its pack. 
Um, and that just really confuses me because in a format built around huge bombs that you build your entire deck around at like five and six mana, Mastermind's Acquisition is a very, very powerful card because it helps in to go get the, the singular thing that you built your deck around. So again, Mastermind's Acquisition is a card not enough people are playing by a long shot. Now, number four, I actually teased a little bit earlier, but that's Captain Cisse and Blackblade Reforged, but to a much lesser extent. Blackblade Reforged, I will say, when games do go long, can just go on normal creatures. You just pay the seven mana if you don't have anything better to do. But Captain Cisse is especially awesome because tapping to just go get, you know, a huge legendary is uh, really, really amazing in a format with so many desirable legendaries. So, again, I see this card come all the way back around so often that I'm, I, I sometimes think people don't know what it does <laughs> because there's again just so many amazing like so many of the huge bomb creatures in this environment at five and six mana are legendary so i'm just really confused as to why people don't take captain cisse number three is treasure map just an all-purpose card that any deck can play that not only ramps you but also provides you card draw and also provides you scries to fix your your you know card your your uh, excuse me to fix your draw step i just broke there for a second because i don't understand why people aren't taking treasure map <laughs> did people forget how good treasure map was yes there's more powerful cards in this environment but very often in packs two and three you've drafted a lot of really powerful cards you're starting to try to fill your deck out with two drops especially in pack three that's a, 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 a situation i find myself in a lot is okay let's fill this curve out and treasure map does that super well helps you get to your big bombs ramps into your big bombs draws if you don't have any other way to draw cards in your mono white deck or whatever there's just it's so good <laughs> treasure map is so good and very often worth the two mana investment because there's not a whole lot of amazing two drops in this environment that you'd rather play I, I hate to say but it just is the case and treasure map is one of the best two drops in the entire format in terms of this cube and just I see it wheel constantly why it's so good play treasure map but here we are number two entrancing melody yeah I've seen this wheel a few times and that just blows my mind <laughs> people take in bolus's clutches like they know how good that card is but people don't take entrancing melody very often now bowling Me bolus's melody <laughs> bolus's melody can you imagine um <laughs> He probably can't carry a tune, but um, Imbolus's Clutches can take any permanent type, and sometimes it'll cost less to cast that than it will to cast this on a desirable target. But that said, Entrancing Melody is still an unbelievable card. <laughs> and sometimes it'll take small creatures that you want. Can I say Dragon Master Outcast one more time in this video before I'm done? I'll probably say it more. But <laughs> sometimes this can take relatively small creatures, steal a Fauna Shaman with this, for instance for just like four mana. There are a lot of pretty valuable creatures at one, two, and three mana in this environment, so sometimes this will be cheap to steal the thing that you want, but even if you have to spend six or seven mana to steal a, you know, five or six drop or something, or four or five drop, uh, then it's still very often worth it in most situations because it just swings the game entirely in one shot. So, especially in the very popular ramp decks in this environment, I'm surprised this doesn't see more play. But let's move on to number one, and this is unequivocally number one. This is the card that absolutely confuses me the most, and again, maybe it's just because some people haven't played with it in the past, but number one is Icy Manipulator, and I am not budging on that. Why do I see this card go around so often? Icy Manipulator is removal that any single deck can play, so if you, if you don't have any other good removal, you know, like a mono blue deck or a mono green deck that doesn't have ram through because ram through is amazing. But, you know, mono green decks that don't have all the removal or, you know, even mono white decks that need a little bit more removal. Um, all could play Icy Manipulator, but but I'll stake this claim here. Even decks with a lot of removal, right, your, your white-black control decks in, in cube, should still play Icy Manipulator. It's so good. Four mana seems like a lot, but being able to switch targets as needed is really, really important, especially in a format with so many powerful attackers, like this format has, you know, tap down their Zatalpa. But until you tap down their Zatalpa, oh, the Ulamog or whatever, start, you know, you can tap down whatever the other biggest creature is before they play those, so... Icy Manipulator is always powerful, always taps down their best creature, really difficult to deal with because there's not a whole lot of main deck artifact hate in this environment, and I haven't even talked about the ability to tap down a land. If your opponent is struggling on lands, this is a very good card, but this is also environment, an environment where people play three color decks like all the time, like probably more than they should, so often on their upkeep, you can tap down their one red source or their one blue source. I've actually come up in, in multiple situations in this environment where I've tapped down, you know, my opponent's only blue source 
or I've tapped down one of my opponent's two blue sources so they can't cast Neutralize or whatever. Um, and actually, once I got a nice for that, tapped down one of my opponent's blue sources, they said nice. <laughs> so it obviously worked, right? Like Icy Manipulator being able to tap down important sources of mana is so much better than you think it is. In some ways, Icy Manipulator is a land destruction card. And very often that dimension will count immensely. But even if it's just tapping down creatures to keep them out of combat, that's unbelievable too. So just play Icy Manipulator and tell me that you don't like it. You should be playing this card in your decks. But now let's move on to the worst cards. And this is only a three card list. And honestly, two of these have cases where you might want to play them, <laughs> honestly. But number three is Underworld Rangehound, which is a Ragehound. I don't know what that was. But uh, Ragehound actually is a card that you might want to play in aggro decks. Like if you're extremely 100%, you know, nose to the floor aggro, like you are, you, you are all in on aggro, then Underworld Ragehound might be a card you want to play, but there are a lot more desirable three drops, right? So I just haven't found myself playing this card, and I've played aggro a couple of times, so yeah, I don't like it. But number two is Manifold Key, because there's just not really a whole lot this does other than like untapped Steel Overseer and a couple of other things, but for the most part, Manifold Key, unless you again are all in, just like with Underworld Ragehound, and you have to be all in on aggro. You have to be 100% on artifact synergies to play Manifold Key, and 100% on artifact synergies is way worse than being all in on aggro. So <laughs> there's just not a whole lot of times where you're going to end up playing Key. It's not a great card. Just, just don't even, don't try it. But number one is Enchanted Carriage. <laughs> Again, like, I guess you could make the argument this is decent against sweepers, and there's some sweepers in this format, but you still have to have creatures to crew it. But it does survive sweepers, and maybe, again, if you're all in on artifacts, you might try this, but it's just, it's bad. If you're playing Enchanted Carriage, I feel bad because there's just way better cards you could be playing at this mana cost. Don't play Enchanted Carriage. But woo, four lists later, one eternity later, we are done with this one. Uh, I hope that's enough information to help you do pretty well in the arena cube. You know, what cards are worth it, which ones aren't, which archetypes are worth it, which ones aren't, how to support them, what cards are blah blah blah. I talked an awful lot in this video and I hope you were able to glean some useful information from it in some way or another. If you did, again, make sure you like the video, sub to the channel, do all that stuff, corset content coming up really soon and hit up the patreon dollar a month to decide what decks you want to see first in course that 2021 season patrons don't worry poll coming up on monday so be ready for that but in any case i am done for this one and i should probably go ahead and start editing it because it's super long so i will catch you cats later in just a day or two i promise i'm dead from the place <laughs> thanks for watching my wizards spread love and be kind